tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to Season 5, Episode 4 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Hey, Heartlanders, you guys patrons yet? Visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to join the club. You'll get ad-free versions of this and all our other podcasts, including hundreds of standalone releases from our audio archives dating back to 2012. It's a great way to show your support, and you get a whole lot for it. I called Wifey the other day and asked, Do you ever get a shooting pain across your body? Like, someone's got a voodoo doll of you and they're stabbing it? Sounding concerned, she said, No. I responded, How about now? <laughs> uh, she didn't laugh. My buddy told me he made a voodoo doll of me. I think he's pulling my leg. Eric Fisher has a pretty unique take on voodoo. Let's get after it. Tanner Tangbridge was a loser. Sorry, no other way to put it. So how does his destiny change for the better, seemingly overnight? Possibly an evil Creole voodoo priest? And now for your indulgence. The Fortune Shifter by Eric Fisher. Prologue, Aurora, Illinois, 1932. The sidewalk smelled of unwashed men, drought year street dust, and partially uncombusted gasoline exhaust from old passing cars as Joni Gardner waited with all the patience a 16-year-old could muster in the breadline. She twirled her long hair braids in an unusually hot day for May, wiping sweat from her pretty round and freckled face with her dingy undersized dress. Who can afford a new one? Her vivacious but haggard mother was nearby talking with some men, trying to get work contacts for dad so he could get another job. They were all desperately counting on it as the Great Depression plotted into another year of gnawing poverty to seemingly swallow the rest of middle-class America. Her father had been a diligent pattern maker for over 10 years before the big layoff of 1931 at Aurora Machine and Tool Company, also known as Aurora Automatic Machinery Company. Among their manufacturing products he worked on proudly were the last models of the Thor make of motorcycle which also provided Indian Motorcycle plenty of potent engines in its earlier days. Nowadays, almost no one was buying bikes, or much of anything else that moved. Joni's stalwart friend Greta Johansson, a year younger and a delicately pale blonde Nordic girl with large blue eyes and blonde hair, bounced over to the slowly moving line, glowing with good news. Some of the older boys in the line took the time. There was plenty of it, after all to notice Greta in her convincingly adult body, and one whistled at her as she met up with Joni. Thanks for advertising, Gret. She was happily bumping gums about her prospective boyfriend, Jerry, 
He's got a job in Brown County, Indiana, planting trees with the CCC. I know he'll propose soon, yeah? And humming the latest big band tunes, they both enjoyed turning way up on their 78 RPM records when their parents were gone. Greta was a good kid, but lacking some attention span, so she strode off to home while enduring another round of catcalls. Yab? Joni could never get accent out of her head. It's job, you dumb Swede. Then, out of the corner of her eye, Joni spied a very old man leaning against a nearby light pole, his countenance being like one with a foot in the grave. He cradled a bottle of booze, probably rock gut, as the distilleries wouldn't start back up until the passing of the 21st Amendment the following year. At this point in the Depression, few people noticed or would tell the police. His white hair was long and peculiar, his chaotic beard a cloak for his chin. Still, the derelict had an air of confidence and refinement about him. It was as if the alcohol was simply keeping him in some holding tank of life. She felt the need to help. It was in her nature when she could do so. She and her friends had developed a quiet dignity toward others when many grown-ups' civility had been steadily eroded away with time, debt, and hopelessness. Joni finally got to hold out her hand for a bowl of food. Tonight's meal was a filling blend of smoked ham and bean soup with early season green onions. She asked Roberta, the nice but sassy colored server, to give her an extra bowl, which was not generally permitted. Roberta smirked and questioned the regular attendee. What you need another bowl for, girl? Ain't we got enough people to feed tonight? You got boyfriend you sneaking food to now? Maybe you do. Don't act like you're still just playing with dolls no more. Joni blushed but pleaded, Nah, ma'am, I'm just wanting to give a bowl to that old guy sitting by the pole. Look at him, he's gonna die if he doesn't eat. I promise, he gets the food, not me, okay? I gotta make tracks for my house pretty soon anyway. Upon further consideration, the steaming fragrant food suddenly plopped into an additional bowl and was handed with a cheap spoon to the altruistic teen. Thank you, Roberta, you're a saint. Yeah, I know. Now get, got a line to feed here including your mama and I need to hurry. Looks like another storm coming in to hit us before dark. Need the damn rain, them farmer's land is all drying up and blowing away out on the plains as I hears it. Then the perky young girl strolled over to the sad looking old man in his ancient worn out suit, proudly presenting the precious bowl of ham and beans. She said over the din of the loud cars and desperate street hawkers, Hey, mister, you want some dinner? I brought it over just for you. You don't look real well. I uh, thought you could use a meal. I had to pull some strings to get this chow, you know. The elderly man looked up, broken from his miserable gaze, and said with an oddly refined tone, Well, young lady, I suppose if you want to feed me that badly, you must be an angel or some otherworldly aberration. Apologetically, I have no... Uh, cabbage for it, you know? Oh no, no angel here. Not what my parents or Pastor Lundgren would tell you anyway. Well, here you go, it's on the house. So many people around here have nothing now. It's no trouble. The old man's eyes suddenly welled up as he gently accepted the bowl of food and put the spoon to his greasy face. Mmm, pure ambrosia. No one has served me dinner this fine since... Well, you wouldn't remember. The Tsar's caviar. The boar's head at the Vanderbilt's. I... I used to own people. Own an existence beyond your comprehension. Now life has come full circle, and I beg for food. Because of him. She looked at him inquisitively as she sat down for a moment. Who? The vagabond clutched his dinner bowl and then spoke with vitriol. The man has gone by many names, but he's a creole demon. I would not be sitting in this hovel without listening to him. He looked at the young girl with sorrowful, doubtful lucidity and asked, I suppose you really wouldn't believe me if I told you that I'm J. Patrick Gilligan, would you? Joni paused. The Icarus airship disaster? That Gilligan? Yes, 
He nodded as he swallowed the last bite of the hot soup, relishing it. You are old enough to know the story, I see. I made a fortune and lost it, along with many innocent lives. A simple shopkeeper, my lust for money got in the way, always coming first. Enough was never enough. Through a series of events, he sensed this and worked his way into the innermost workings of my household and business, posing as a simple Negro servant at first, and then he became my right-hand man when I found he could help me in, well, unnatural ways to prosper. Starting with discerning the right stocks to buy, I came out of the panic of 93 wealthier than I could have ever imagined. He introduced me to engineers and visionaries who believed air flight was the real future for society, not railroad train transport or cars now. Soon, research money and investments kept coming, more than I could count. After a while, I couldn't even stop my obsession for wealth even if I wanted to do so. I found myself suddenly to be a real butter and egg man, as they say. <laughs> Before I knew it, I was ignoring my own family and devoting copious time to buying out opportunities I needed from Rockefeller's oil and Carnegie's steel holdings to beat them at their own game. They owned railroads, natural resources, land, and men. But then Icarus air carriers began to take thousands of passengers and tons of freight anywhere in America right over them more quickly and more safely. By 1895, we had patented and funded an air machine with a metal frame and internal combustion engine propeller drive years ahead of anyone else and a new industry blossomed. Patents, royalties, and corporate bio from Icarus alone would have kept me as a lifetime millionaire in any right. Joni didn't know what to think of this old man or his wacky story, but she felt unable to stop listening. Killigan repositioned himself on the dirty pavement, put down his now empty bowl, and spoke more softly after a swig of his boots. However, right after I had a falling out with the servant over, uh personal matters, suddenly and mysteriously I found my bank accounts were being drained. Meanwhile, that's when the Andover, Pennsylvania disaster happened as the flagship Icarus vessel, the Styx, was on a stop from Cleveland to Philadelphia on November 22, 1912, in fair weather no less. Somehow, an in-air ignition happened, and 189 screaming people died instantly as the passenger airship exploded and crashed 200 feet to the ground, trying to land onto one of my Gila ports there during a busy Thanksgiving holiday weekend. Anyway, that's the story you and to everyone else heard, young lady. And to think it happened the same year as the sinking of the Titanic. I would have no mercy from the press for any proposed negligence causing the casualties. The evil man then disappeared with no connection to me nor responsibility for any of the tragic fatalities of the airship befalling me. Oh no, he was never seen again, and in the meantime, I lost everything I had worked for in a matter of days. He had never warned me of the addictions to use his powerful charm, the damned fortune shifter. Then, without notice, five homes and twenty cars were stripped from my possession and sold for compensation lawsuits from the victims' families and federal investigations. I was ruined in 1913. So now here I am, rotting away on some street corner or soup kitchen floor for years. Yet, I still have a few items of value left to share and want to pass along to a charitable person such as yourself before I get mugged in my sleep by some Chicago goon. Here, girl, this is for you. I believe some recompense is in order. Not many people have offered me as much help in recent years. This will be of no value to me soon enough. Killigan reached into his grimy satchel and produced a small box, smudged now, but its exterior a finely finished mahogany with intricate inlays. The girl unfurled the object within the cloth from the box and pulled out its contents, a giant diamond ring. It had the initials JPK engraved in its lavish 24-karat gold band. Joni was temporarily struck dumb at the gift 
not even daring to imagine its value. She finally found her voice and roughly replied, Holy smokes, I, I really can't take this, sir. But please, you will and must take it. And it's very real, I assure you, so don't hawk it for some stupid dress or whatever. Most girls still have no reason or ability to go to college, but if you do, this should adequately cover the expenses and then some. I'd say so. Joni was shocked. Selling this ring could get her whole family out of poverty. She carefully tucked the entire diminutive box in her purse before anyone saw her, making sure it wouldn't fall out. That jewelry could get her beaten or killed nowadays, even by ordinary desperate people. No one would care if she was just a schoolgirl. Still worth several hundreds of thousand dollars on a bad day, I imagine. My old friend Ephraim Baumberger can give you cash for it. The people who still have money are making more of it. <laughs> and why not give it to you? I can't take it with me. Besides, my wonderful and free dinner has sustained me for another day thanks to you. As the Bible says, you did unto the least of these. And I am the least of these now. As a gust of warm, tepid air swept through the street anticipating rain, the tattered old man simply looked up at the sky, took a long swig from his rancid whiskey bottle and patiently reflected, Now I have one more task to perform. I would share the other valuable remnants in my satchel with you as well, but it contains several artifacts which will clear my name of the travesties wrought on the Andover Manifest and other matters. I'd advise stepping back, please. Killigan pulled out a handsomely chromed Colt 45 revolver out of his satchel and placed it next to his temple. Don't do that. What's wrong with you, sir? Do you need a place to stay? What can I do to help? Nothing, I'm afraid. That Creole voodoo priest lives to build and destroy people. He's been doing it to people in America since he escaped as a Haitian slave in 1735. 1735, he told me. He's brought down many over the years, pinnacles of industry and government since Napoleon, yet you never read of him in history. He's not a natural man, I tell you. Confused, Joni cried out, Wait, we can help you. You don't need to live in fear of him. Don't you fear the Lord? Yes, I fear him. And I shall meet him soon. As the girl wondered if the old man would accept Christ as his Lord, the gun went off. Pieces of bone and blood sprayed onto everyone waiting at the street corner, including some on Joni's arm, cutting her a bit. Due to the angle of the shot, some brain tissue spattered on both those in line for food, as well as onto the windshield of a shiny Hudson sedan waiting at the nearby intersection stoplight. Its driver promptly vomited onto the floor of his prized car. Soon, before the ambulance and police arrived, rain began as predicted. Onto the streets of Aurora washed the blood of former billionaire J. Patrick Killigan, the first patron of automated air travel, made and ruined by a simple servant. Or was he? With his demonic sadism and offers of unlimited wealth and power, where would the man-thing show up next? Who knew? Where there was a spirit of insatiable human greed or stupidity, that's where he would be, patiently waiting to seduce and destroy. Yellowwood, Indiana. Now. Corey Arvin wiped his broad brow and angry, narrow, Kentucky-esque eyes from the sweat gleaned by summer sun on the parking lot as he smoked the last cigarette on his way to clock in second shift at Southern Quality Gear and Axel. SQGA. 204 days without an accident. SQGA, where quality and safety come first, boasted the sign out front on the better-paved portion of Huron Road. Wow. No one ever thought of that phrase before, he thought cynically. His single-seat Harley Sportster exhaust ticked as the metal retracted from the heat of the engine being shut off. Last week, it had been so hot the kickstand actually started to melt into the asphalt, but not nearly as much as with the larger slammed bagger and two-ring bikes the Harley 
and Indian guys with more seniority and income rode. Corey disdained the company, most of his co-workers and most everything in life, but damn if he wasn't a good worker. Possibly the best gear and spindle man in the plant on his shift. He intuitively knew machine tolerances like Kiss knew how to throw a rock concert back in his parents' day. Not that they cared much about him. Still, he was pushing 28 and wanted more out of life. But life wasn't biting. He had been more than happy to split his chaotic home in Bedford after high school and somehow found this factory job in Yellowwood, Indiana, the scenic but isolated capital of nowhere on the backside of the Hoosier National Forest. Entering the plant for another mind-numbing Monday morning, Corey was instantly overwhelmed by the collective noise, heat, and dim eerie lighting in the sprawling open factory. He thought he had never get used to it, but the pay for his position was the best SQGA offered and he took it. For his level of education, it was the best job around, period. His daily appearance, cut off wife beater t-shirt with large arms sporting several tattoos, short hair and mustache, was typical attire at the plant. Blue collar chic. Prior to clocking in, he'd still be dripping sweat off his stern chin, and Southern didn't believe in providing air conditioning for their workers except for those on the heat treatment line, apparently. A factory tradition nor to be passed around was the few old boy lifers in heat treatment department always get away with smuggling in a quart of beer at break in the parking lot to cool down. One of Corey's few and good drinking buddies, Tanner Tangbridge, a squirrely little man of about 21 with longer and crazier hair and a spindlier attempt at the beard than most of the men at the gear, waved as he headed to his own job in assembly. A bit bleary-eyed, he called in a high-pitched voice, Hey man, it's Monday already. Where'd the freaking weekend go? See you at Dad's place for a picture after work? Sounds good. I'd like my ten bucks back too. Betting on NASCAR doesn't suit you, man. Lost again! <laughs> As the gambling conquered assembler shot him a nasty but acknowledging grin, Corey checked his chart and proceeded with the day's assignments. 27 108 pound gears to program in the CNC and cut by 11 o'clock, end of shift. 27? Really? The tall, stocky man knew this to be a reasonable task, but he still hated the company for shoving such a load on his watch, especially on the first day of the week. Corey expected his shift supervisor, a generally even-handed, middle-aged company man named Dennis Fournier, to make some rounds early, but instead a large sweating man with little hair left and a look of perennial exasperation came around the corner between the painted safety lines of the walkways, heading toward him. Shit, it was shift manager, his noble lord Tony McFarland. Weird to see him out of that chair in his climate-controlled antiseptic office upstairs, Corey thought. What's up? He continued to check his CNC calculations from the office pencil-necked engineers in their distant design offices and fed the production data into the machine's computer. He made darn sure the door was closed before hitting enter on a large green button and stood by observing the whirring behemoth as it cut and detailed the piece of steel to within the specified tolerance of one thousandth of an inch. He deliberately ignored the portly manager standing nearby as long as he could. Arvin, hey Arvin. Do you have a moment? We have some changes in our workforce I need to discuss with you. Now, please. Yeah, sure, Tony. This part is in process and will take a few minutes to finish anyway. The young man said loudly over the grinding and spraying shrapnel going on within the booth. If a man were to be trapped inside the finishing booth, well, it had happened once since Corey had been there. Not a pretty sight of leftover ground-up flesh for the coroner to examine for sure. You know, after the company meeting last month, that SQGA let all of our people go at our LaFontaine, Louisiana plant. German buyout down there worked for the stockholders, not for us here, I guess. I didn't agree with it, just so you know. Anyway, the company offered some transfers up to Yellowwood for their senior people, and I think after a couple of good corporate quarters, we'll all be okay. Point is, only about 20 people out of 125 decided to transfer here, the rest opted for Pelhamburg, Kentucky or Rephaim, Georgia warehouse operations. Don't ask me why. 
We're starting Mosum on second or third shift, so I wanted to let you know you'll be sharing the love with on the CNC machines. Listen, we need everybody in a skilled machining position now, and you'll get this guy up to speed on anything we need him to, understand? Southern Quality just got a major defense contract for a new MIA-2C tank transmission component. Means overtime out your ass, but it's too much for the few people we have now on assembly, let alone finishing. If we pull this shipment off on time, maybe we push marketing to beat those union bastards up at Fairfield, or whatever they're called now in Lafayette, for the GEET 44 C5 locomotive drivetrain contract next year. Listen up, because I'm pushing everybody. Neville has my balls until we squeeze harder and get more production. Visualizing the company's owner and founder, Albert Neville's spoiled grandson Mark Neville touching anyone's testicles, made Corey suppress a laugh, as well as from McFarland's use of words, squeeze harder. But the Neville family still owned most of SQGA stock and a significant piece of whatever blue-collar employment was left in Yellowwood. So, my conversation comes down to this. Your new bench partner is a guy named Jacques Iwe. He's this 33-year-old from Haiti. Got experience in spindle finishing as well as assembly. He'll join you as soon as he fills out the office forms. Expect him around 4 o'clock. I'm counting on you to train him and keep him productive. He was one of LaFontaine's better workers from what I read. Okay, thanks, Tony. I'll look for him. Guy's got to stick out like a sore thumb around here. Corey said as the hefty manager turned and strode back to the comfort of the air-conditioned upstairs office, clutching the greasy stair railing with some effort. Not many blacks around this part of the woods. Not after dark, anyway. McFarland yelled back, Don't worry, Arvin. He's not after your job. If you two get along and he works out, I might even give you a both day shift. Overlooking this long-term opportunity to morosely focus on the situation now, Corey thought, Great, a fucking foreigner who probably can't even speak English. Corey already had enough of Mexicans working at SQGA. They generally couldn't understand instructions to do the job, and then they'd vaporize whenever there was a threat of the Immigration and Naturalization Service showing up at the plant. As for day shift, he should have had it by now anyway as the old schoolers were dropping like flies with retirement. But he preferred getting up late and staying up late. Still, he had to give this Iwe guy a chance. After all, he needed someone to cover his butt on other machines while he worked the finisher. The finisher meant the ARS 2500R, SQGA's premier grinding and lathing machine, a 200-horsepower whirling behemoth with a torquey shaft that worked over steel at a production speed of up to 1,500 RPM. It was a critical last step to the company's output. If the metal didn't pass muster after being processed on the ARS, it was scrap, and after a while, someone would lose their job of making a habit of that. Of course, if one was in a hurry and stuck their arm in too far with a part, Safety issues were not a large concern with SQGA until a quota was due or if OSHA showed up, and several persons had already lost life or limb with this machine over the past few years. Non-union cheap asses, Corey always thought. As one of the few remaining employees qualified to run the ARS, Corey knew he was both committed to it and could be killed by it. He had invested the past several years maintaining it and caressing it as if a mechanical lover. It treated him well, as if almost communicating with him, and it guaranteed him a secure and decent income. Unlike others, he didn't fear the machine, and his work showed it. Jacques Eoui showed up on time, a bit early actually. He was short and had the dark skin of a Haitian with a short afro and beard with no mustache. His brown eyes and thick brows were intense and purposeful looking. While a bit haggard in his demeanor, he presented himself with a perpetual smile. That could get annoying only to someone like Corey. Ah, uh, hello, ma. I'm Jacques. You can call me Jacques if it suits you better. He grinned and said with a thick Creole accent, offering his calloused hand as he approached the CNC station. Corey tried to be civil, but was to the point. He shook the dark man's hand firmly and said even-handedly, Hey, whatever, man. Jack works. Look, 
there's your bench. For starters, you'll get to know our inventory by helping me load and wash off these gears and spindles before they go to distributing or shipping. I don't know how much they told you about training, but the ARS here is a gruesome mother, and if you don't feed it right, it will feed on you. Now, you have to load these gears just right for the final cuts. Do you see the alignment rings? Yes, I see. I'd be fine with this machine and anything else you have for me to do. I worked on a similar beast in La Fontaine. Ah, also notice you have the cutting shaft somewhat out of alignment. Very inefficient, man. But then he is so wash out. As Corey instantly bristled at that, the man just waved his hand over the large mechanism, fervently mumbled something incomprehensible. The finisher hummed for a brief moment. That is better. You see, the right end cutting shaft balancer was simply off. You would not have known that according to the computer. It will be fine now and work better at a higher speed. Nice and sharp. <laughs> now, look at your part as it comes out, Corey. Corey read the specs on the computer screen as the hot steel was finished and the shaft slowed down with an ominous whir with a buzzer going off when finished as if it was a microwave meal. Upon inspection, his keen eye and computer analysis noted that the part was perfectly within tolerances, ready to be cooled off, cleaned, and shipped. Well, shit. You're right, Jack. The calibration was off. How did I miss that? Monsieur, no matter more. Let us get the rest done. I have learned some things that could help you get ahead of this job. Or in life. Oblivious to the larger comment, Corey said, Right on. Well, we got a load to do for a Monday. Hey, I'd like to meet my friends from the plant after work tonight. They're good guys and we hang out regularly, but the town's kind of redneck, and if you're a Negro... Well, I've been used to that for a long time. I have a nice place at the apartments on the edge of town and I don't bother no one. Good if they don't bother me neither. <laughs> he chuckled with an ominous tone. All right. Let's get her done and then let's party. Jacques Elie turned out to be a better co-worker than Corey could have imagined. They interacted like clockwork, turning and finishing the quota of gears and spindles together for the evening by 10.18. Corey spent a few moments triumphantly getting to sit around on the clock before his department supervisor Dennis showed up to be impressed. Scrutinizing the parts checkoff list from a clipboard hanging on a nearby column, he exclaimed at their productivity. Wow, good work. We may get that GE contract yet. You boys go home now early if you want to. You set the bar for the week now. Bonsoir, good evening. Anything for the company, man. Jack exclaimed as he proceeded to clock out. Later, Corey walked down the street to nearby Dad's place, a small but popular working man's dive you'd expect to find in southern Indiana. A long main room with a wood bar that has seen better days, some opposing tables for the limited food menu the patrons would dine on, and a dirty set of non-ADA compliant restrooms in the back. A small poorly lit stage was crammed in the rear corner of the bar's L-shaped floor for the occasional country or southern rock band, as there were limited entertainment appearances in this isolated part of the state. The place was nice enough during the day, but when the gear's second shift got off its later hours were where things could become a bit sketchy. Several of the local girls, some with young children at home with a parent or a patient babysitter, had already flocked to the bar for an extension of the previous weekend's drinking and frivolity, some anticipating the arrival of their boyfriends or those who could be. There were generally two ways this system of hooking up worked in isolated Yellowwood. Ultimately, the girl became one's loving wife or she became the bitch in child support court. Sometimes both. Corey usually came in like clockwork. Tonight he was sitting at a table as Connie, the secondary waitress, expected. Tammy Colbetter usually worked this shift. She was young and had a great frame, but Connie's body was nothing to sneeze at and was friendlier and more observant to customers. Getting better tips and exercise at work was her revenge for being a middle-ager in a young girl's job. Got the night off early, hon? Good for you. Pitcher's a buck off tonight. Draft for you? She inquired with her trailer park draw. Make it two, con. I got some company coming. 
Ooh, so who's the lady? Or are you just buying for Tanner, Zach, and Ryan again tonight? No ladies this evening. Zach and Ryan conveniently didn't show up either. They owe me a picture from Payday. I'm just hanging out waiting for my new bench partner at work. He's one of the Gears LaFontaine guys who transferred up here. Figure get a few drinks to break the ice, you know? Gotcha. Coming up. Want cheeseburger or quesadilla with that? Y'all single guys need someone to cook for you and do other things after all. Nah, I'm good. Maybe later if Jesse's still cooking. Corey saw through the hit on and he was smart enough not to dip the wick with someone who already had three kids to support. Tanner stumbled through the door and affably yelled hello to the regulars. Jack walked in behind him cautiously. They both found Corey at the grimy table. Connie wasn't the only one in the increasingly loud bar to turn heads at Jack. Where's Zack and Ryan? Donnie? He never misses a Monday here. Dad even has his own chair reserved for him, spoiled SOB. Don't know, Corey. Jack here wanted to tag along so I could introduce him to the other guys. Bummer they didn't show up. So I was telling him about my 74 Camaro. Yeah, yeah, the famous 74 Camaro. The one that hasn't moved in five years. Sell it for scrap, fix it, or give it a rest, man. Some workers sitting at the cramped nearby tables who overheard this laughed at the pointless ambitions of the hapless Tanner who hadn't made it through high school and was kept on the payroll at the gear more for pity than performance. No way! Tanner couldn't bear to think of life without his prized possession, an old muscle car he inherited from his grandfather and subsequently left it to rot in his front yard. The joke in southern Indiana is to find one's home you turn off the paved roads, turn right at this appliance in the yard, and pass that car on blocks. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Whatever wasn't pushed into the ravine was considered architectural ornamentation by some. The bar's old jukebox was still well played, reminding patrons of the more minor hits from the 60s and 70s. This Bob Dylan song from 1979 warned, But you're gonna have to serve somebody. Yes, you are. You're gonna have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the law, but you're gonna have to serve somebody. Jack pondered. Perhaps there is a way to repair and restore this classic vehicle. I could take a look at it this weekend. Tara, if I am successful, would you be interested in helping me with a small project in return down the road? Jack's enthusiasm and Tanner's lack of resources convinced him to try. Sure, man. Have at it. I'll pick you up Saturday by noon. No earlier. We usually close this place down on Friday nights. All right, then, Jamie. Buddy, I appreciate the hospitality, but I must drink up and get home soon. I need to study up on these finisher you talk about, Corey. The Creole went to the Grammy restroom after powering down the rest of his beer and came back to the table, bowed to thank the buxom Connie for the drink. Missy, intending to leave Corey and Tanner to their usual vapid tavern discussions, strode toward the door when a burly man with a long beard and solid build intentionally bumped into him. Watch it, Darky. Hey, didn't I see you down at the plant today? You working with these pussies, then hanging out with them on top of it? Classic. <laughs> All losers. <laughs> The barrel-chested, inebriated man who feigned offense was the resident SQGA second-shift bully and gambler Jimmy Lee Arkin. He had been drinking with one of the girls and hanging out playing a game of pool by himself, which he was losing. How is that even possible? In the darkened corner by the bar's stage. The date wasn't going well for Jimmy Lee's advances, so his mood had soured considerably within the past hour. He was in his usual mood of looking for any excuse to start something. My mistake. I must not have seen you, Jack humbly replied. Yeah, just watch what you're doing. You'll learn I ain't the guy to mess with around a factory neither, foreigner. Jimmy Lee then turned his ire upon the diminutive Tanner, almost pulling him out of his chair. Hey, worm, you still owe me twenty bucks from the last race. Get it to me by Friday, okay? 
Tanner nodded in complete agreement while Corey looked on with a hateful grimace. He had crossed paths with Jimmy Lee enough. This just reminded him of a punk stealing some kid's lunch money in junior high school. What are you looking at, Harvin? You're lucky you don't owe me nothing right now. Corey looked away and hoped Jimmy Lee would just forget about this girl, stumble out the door, and not be lying in wait to start a fight in the parking lot later. What a dick, Tanner said, somewhat still shaken. It never stops. No one will or can stand up to him. I wish he would die. I wish he would dry up and blow away. Jack's countenance became serious. Yes, a fitting end to that piece of garbage. Perhaps I can help. Corey laughed. Man, he'd tear you apart. Jimmy's as mean as he is stupid. Not a good combination. We will see. I will show you gentlemen something a gift I learned to use long ago. Ah, I just happen to have it in my work satchel. Oh yes, I would appreciate you all keeping this between us. There may be a benefit for you later, he said with a malevolent smile. He reached in and displayed a small bowl, nothing too ornate, but it was covered with gold leaf on the inside, which had a sort of additional inner chamber, like a stomach under restriction curves in the ceramic. The outer part of the bowl had a wooden trim on the top and was finished in ceramic with a ring of interconnected human faces, some laughing, some screaming. It seemed to pulse a bit in his hands, freaking Corey out. Tanner, however, seemed fascinated with the trinket. It was innocuous enough looking. He called it the fortune shifter. You see, I took this napkin from Jimmy Lee's table while he was blustering at you, Tanner. It has his fingerprints on it. Now, I wring out the evil on this man. He slowly explained as his hand squeezed the wet napkin. Then he promptly dropped a small piece of it into the bowl and chanted some incomprehensible creole. Even in the bar's late-night honky-tonk noise, Corey swore he heard a small scream coming from within the bowl's lower chamber. He will not be bothering any of you again. Well, it is lay for me. The bowl takes my energy sometimes. The beer certainly does. They all laughed nervously at that as Jack carefully replaced the bowl into his satchel. Jack went through the door to go home, confident of having no surprise altercation with the brutish Jimmy Lee Arkin. You trust him? Corey almost whispered, as if Jack could still somehow hear them. Sure, why not? Jack's cool guy, he just talks funny, you know? Seems to be confident and wants to help people. I wish more dudes were like that at the gear. I've had enough of dead-end rednecks and prick bosses. I don't think I'll ever get any good around here. Tanner sighed, sizing up Lizzie Morehouse, an attractive girl he knew from school who was now picking up a Long Island iced tea at the bar to take to her current boyfriend. Yeah, I'll drink to that. Just have a hard time trusting anyone. You know that. Seems kind of weird a dude like that would want to come to Yellowwood. It's more like to escape from than escape to. Maybe not for him, Tanner muttered as they stayed and ordered another pitcher. The alleged privilege from the local cops were having a short drive home and working second shift. As the week progressed at Southern Quality Gear and Daxel, there was no sign of Jimmy Lee. When a former girlfriend bothered to have the police check on him, Somewhat out of fear of any domestic violence repercussions, the Yellowwood Police Department indeed found what was left of Jimmy Lee. He had been prostrated on the floor in a contorted position, all his flesh withered and leathery to the point of being mummified. The bodily fluids had been sucked into his rancid carpet, gluing him there like a sick metal band poser. A gruesome facial expression of frozen fear showed that he probably didn't use his last seconds on earth to get right with the Lord. His body was so dried out, there was virtually no stench, perhaps withholding the pursuance of his absence by his neighbors. There was little investigation into this macabre incident from the police. One Sergeant Del Santo, who had been assigned to the gruesome Thornhill Massacre case last year, was disbelieving as he saw that another, well, supernatural death had occurred on his watch, and he thought it best to keep Harkin's unfortunate end to minimal public knowledge for everyone's good. The improbable coroner's report could not really address the curse or state of decay that had been directed to Harkin. There was no autopsy. No matter, as few attended what passed for his funeral. 
The cremation was an easy task at this point, his body igniting earlier in the process than for most. I wish he would dry up and blow away, echoed Tanner's curse in Corey's head as he sat through Jimmy Lee's brief memorial service at work. As things went on, he would start putting two and two together about Jack and his strange bowl. As the following weekend arrived, Corey slept off his typical weekend debauchery, alone. Tanner had picked up Jack in his aging pickup and they arrived at the Tangbridge Estate, a modest and somewhat dilapidated one-story frame home on two overgrown acres with no garage but a large pole barn nearby. The home overlooked a small wooded ravine near the western edge of Yellowwood. Tanner had grown up with the local rural Yellowwood kids, including hoods like Jimmy Lee and meth makers like the late Nathan Iceman Green and 12-pack A-maker. He had read about the Iceman's demise in the unsolved Thornhill Road massacre last year. Man, that home invasion didn't turn out well, as those creeps' bodies were so torn apart the county coroner had to use dental records to identify them, all over something to do with the old guy who lived in an old farmhouse there and who certainly couldn't have disposed of all of those hopped-up punks by himself. Judging from what the cops could put together, someone, or some things, didn't go in there for dope or money at the same time as the intruder's home invasion searching for drugs. They just wanted warm, shredded human flesh. Meat. And I mean meat. His head became light at these thoughts as he slowed through the woods on the narrow road and approached the gravel drive of his home. As they pulled into Tanner's drive, Jack exclaimed, There it is, man. It is beautiful. The dilapidated Camaro sat at the rear end of the half-gravel, half-dirt driveway on a small slope of a small hill behind the house which emptied into the ravine behind the house. At least the parking brake still worked. Well, Jack, I'm glad you're so enthusiastic. I can't figure what's wrong with it, man. I've had a bunch of guys from work look at it. Sounds like the pistons are frozen up. I guess there's still oil in it, but rear seal leaks when you add any. No telling how the tranny works until the engine gets going. I think something electrical or in the fuse box is shot too. Well, tires and trim look aged, but at least the interior ain't too bad for being outside this long. Original vinyl bucket seats, man. Guess the original paint ain't too bad, he rationalized. It was a metallic blue at some previous point, now faded along with the chrome and decals. Thing only has 103,000 original miles on it and got an L48 V8. I thought it was worth saving. Yes, about that. Tell me, Tanner, what is it worth to you to have this vehicle running, maybe even restored? Well, shit, I'd give anything short of my soul for that. Yeah. Just short of your soul, of course. Tanner looked confused. Sure, whatever. Want a beer while checking it out? I've got some bud in the fridge. Yes, thank you, man. This Indiana humidity is not bad next to New Orleans, but does make a man crave a drink. Now, my small item from the bar is in the backpack. It can't help us. It's an heirloom from my old country. It asks nothing from you, not now anyway. So you see, it works by putting something of value into the bowl, Tanner. It senses in response to one's desires, aspirations, and lusts. Perhaps try dropping in a small piece of the machine. Tanner, had he been a little brighter, would have freaked out a little at this request, but he nonetheless complied. He produced a small switchblade and tore off a hanging piece of the car's languishing interior and dropped it into the weird bowl. It seemed to make some barely audible shrieking sound. Now, Jack ordered, we go into your house and drink some beer and wait. We'll see how the car reacts. This year car ain't moving. I thought you understood that, Tanner reiterated. Jack clapped him on the back and then looked into the young man's eyes with a mesmerizing smile. The vehicle will move and will be as new. You just overlook some simple procedures. It is not your fault. Anyone could miss it. You will see. Then you remember my favor, yes? It will not be for some time. I need you to transform into the person I, uh... You always wanted to be first. Now, time for drinks inside. 
As they relaxed around the grubby kitchen table, soon a faint sound of metal bending occurred outside the window. After an hour or so, they went back outside to the rear drive, the humidity accosting them. Summer bugs and birds sang in the nearby woods as the afternoon sun beat down, a recent rain filling the small ravine creek behind Tanner's house with temporary purpose and gurgling sound. You see, I corrected the vehicle's problems, no? Tanner looked at the Camaro and dropped his jaw. It sat fully restored, paint glistening as if on the showroom floor. You gotta be fucking kidding. As Jack gestured with his hand to the front of the car, Tanner ran up to the previously dilapidated coupe and popped the hood. The engine, hoses, everything was as new. Impossible. Taking his ancient ignition key, Tanner turned the engine on. The V8 fired up instantly with a potent roar and then idled obediently. As the engine purred, Eloe wasted no time. Now you believe me. I will come for my favor later, agreed? If you start to put your request into my bowl, you can get anything. Perhaps I will find a nice Tiffy, a single girl for you to cruise around in that car. It is an impressive ride, no? Tanner was beyond words. Yeah, wow, but no extra chicks around here, not for me. The demon man wasted no time, still clutching the fortune shifter and delivering into it a small scrap of pornographic website image he had printed back at his apartment for just such an occasion. Again, the chanting, then, What do you mean, Ma? It's a calm. Sure enough, just then a convertible with four young townie girls still unattached females Tanner had gone to school with, pulled around the road and into his obscure driveway. They were blasting some overplayed classic rock on the stereo and shaking their immodestly dressed bodies. Sounded like Guns N' Roses. Could have been worse, like Nickelback. The hot, long-haired blonde in the passenger seat climbed over her attractive brunette driver friend and said, Wow! Hey, where's the party, Tanner? We heard you had a new ride. You didn't think we had forgotten about you, right? Jack smiled and even-handedly said, Well, you and your friends will need some refreshments. Perhaps you left some liquor in your truck. I will check. He walked over, waving his hand, and somehow, opening the ancient Ford F-150 toolbox without a key, produced several bottles of high-end vodka with a mysteriously placed cooler full of chilled orange juice and sodas. You'd best attend to your guests on me, friend. I will introduce myself to them if you don't want to. Look at this beautiful car. I'd love a ride in it, Tanner. Where have you been hiding? Uh, uh I don't know. Just working. The redhead turned to her Hispanic friend in the back seat to giggle and then was bolder. We want to get loaded. Then whatever happens, happens, yeah? She took a large gulp of Jack's vodka straight out of the bottle and promptly disposed of her halter top, leaving a bare minimum of clothing to no imagination. The other girls followed suit in quest in Tanner's attention. They were like a Girls Gone Wild on Spring Break video. Jack looked at Tanner with an intense and somewhat scary look and said plainly, You see, boy, I can solve all of your problems easily like this. Just put things of value to you into the fortune shifter and you will become richer and wiser than any of these factory guys, or the governor, if you wish, for which you are destined. Governor Tangbridge? Wow! Tanner thought at first Jack had gone too far in his boasting. Yet, here it was, his car looking like new, with the hot, horny chicks lining up suddenly. He didn't stop to think what the catch was, which was exactly how Ioe liked it. Sherry, the shapely blonde, ignored this conversation and was now sitting on Tanner's lap, posturing against Liz, the vivacious redhead, and Carmen, the darker girl, for makeout rights. Tanner had little experience or idea how to handle this, but he knew he needed the Creole man to get ahead. Boy, did he deliver. As the sun was setting, Tanner and Jack partied on to exhaustion, the younger man eventually having to perform for all the leggy, aggressive girls and along the way, he happened to find a few new hundred-dollar bills in his wallet on top of all this surrealism. As Jack helped himself to two of the other young women later in the extra bedroom with shameless erotic promises, 
He called to Tanner on the next room. Remember, Mom, you owe me a favor now. <laughs> Corey, missing all the previous weekend debauchery at Tanner's, clocked in the following Monday, surprised to see Tanner the center of attention in the break room, showing phone images of his newly restored Camaro. Yeah, I've been holding out on y'all. I've been working on that car for five years, man. Got some new lady friends out of the deal. You remember Sherry King? Of course they all did. No way, the group stated in disbelief. Yeah, we're sort of going out. Her friends like to come along, if you know what I mean. The trash talking and harumphing of the disbelieving blue collar men went on for some time, until a few evenings later, they saw Tanner show up in the parking lot driving the sparkling classic Chevrolet muscle car with his female company at Dad's. Their friend Donnie even relinquished his prize seat at the bar for the new king of the party. Meanwhile, Corey starched his head in wonder at what transformation was happening to a scrawny, dead-end guy like Tanner. Sure, he was the Finnish man's best and probably only friend, and Corey wanted to keep Tanner from trouble, but he knew, he knew there was something off about Jack, something creepy. That bowl he used on Big Jimmy Lee at the bar had to have killed him. All of Tanner's newfound wealth and attention could be traced back to that damn fortune shifter thing, but Tanner would have none of it when Corey suggested Jack was behind this with something really bad in mind. Tanner kept blabbing on about how starting a career in politics and getting out of SQGA altogether, and lo and behold, the youngest man on record to file was running against Mayor Schmidt this fall and was already ahead in the polls. This all seemed out of place for a kid who barely showed up to work on time and who hadn't previously cared about anything civically oriented. It was like the people of the town were becoming mesmerized, enchanted. As Tanner stuck a $100 bill into the fortune shifter one afternoon at work, knowing copious amounts of money would soon flow to him now, he visualized. Soon, Mayor Tingbridge, next Governor Tingbridge. These weak mortals... Nothing can stop me. He then shook his head and wondered where that thought had come from. He texted Sherry to come over that evening. Since he had given her a key to his house, she was probably already there hitting the now well-stocked bar he had built. The men contracted to pave his drive, paint his house, and build a garage for the Camaro would be there on time next week or else. That same day, Corey went around to one of the load factory's large roof support pillars when he almost ran into the man. He stared up at an unbelievably tall, broad-shouldered fellow with long, dark, and impeccably trimmed hair and a nice suit that fit him well. No sweat coming from his brow in this summer factory heat. No one else noticed his presence. Hey man, are you from OSHA? Sure, assembly's a little loose on quality control, but we're training all these new guys from another plant and... The suave and surreal man relaxed against a nearby post and speaking with a hip West Coast accent interjected, Corey, it's all right. My human name is Observer and I simply want to see if Jacques Awe is around. His demeanor was soothing yet to the point. I am not here to interfere or we would have sent my bro intervention and you don't want to get on the wrong side of him. Uh, who are you talking about? Jack's over in the wash bay cleaning parts. Look, I have to get back and finish cutting my gears for the shift. If you're looking for someone, maybe check with Tony McFarland upstairs. He's the shift supervisor. Now, if you'll excuse me. The looming man caught Corey's arm with a huge hand and now spoke intently to him, his strength easily outmatching Corey's. I just want to send a message to Iowa. We've been searching for him for a long time, a really long time. And if you don't understand what he is, understand this. He is wrecking the life of your friend, as he has done to countless people over the ages. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Tell him, his time in this body is almost up. That's all. Oh, by the way, I really enjoyed your crusade in Africa a few years from now. The Creator will be pleased with your intensity and knowledge of the Bible to reach people. 
This experience in the factory will help you to move forward in discernment. We'll keep an eye for you, for sure. What are you talking about, man? I haven't been to church 20 years. No, but you will. For now, as they say here, have a nice day, pastor. Incredulous, as Corey spun around to protest the larger, felt man had already disappeared. Was this a dream? Pastor Arvin? Dude's got the wrong dude. Still, there was something morally upsetting to Corey about Jack, and at some point he needed to confront the Haitian on what was really transforming his friend Tanner. While Corey couldn't quite put his finger on it, Jack plotted his next moves. Tanner was becoming Jack's best prospect in a hundred years. The steady transformation into a magnetic politician and businessman would be right around the corner. With his spells and charms, Jack could see down the road. The doltish Tanner would rise meteorically in the public eye, just a crash and burn in a sex scandal Jack was already visualizing. Then the Creole voodoo man with his demonic longevity would once again receive his gratification of personal human destruction. As it turned out, Corey wouldn't get to speak with Jack about the strange goings-on with Tanner or his new wealth, popularity, and bolder, more confident personality, even speaking of putting in his two weeks' notice at SQGA. While company rules frowned on eating lunch at the workstations, the overtime was now on, so management looked the other way once in a while. As Corey was preparing to have a chat with Jack at their bench, Rusty appeared with a tray of homemade steaming shredded chicken and ground beef tacos to share with the boys. Okay, they had been catered for. Rusty couldn't cook boiled water. As he distributed the lunch, the messy tacos dripped and spilled onto the floor. Jack had carelessly left the fortune shifter on the workbench by his lunch. He wouldn't realize his mistake until too late. Drowned out by a loud nearby spindle machine, he didn't hear the telltale small scream coming from within the bowl or notice its temporary pulsations. The finishing supervisor that day, Nate Gandro, approached Jack. Hey, I hear you're getting really up to speed with the finisher. Good, because we need you to clean up some truck parts as soon as you get done on break, okay? McFarlane is screaming to get these parts out. Jack replied confidently. No worries, Mom. I'm on it now. Jack set down his food and strode down the safety-striped walkway toward the ARS 2500R and out of Corey's sight. Not too long afterward, a horrific shriek emanated from the finishing area, followed by loud thumping sounds, then nothing. A warning alarm went off throughout the plant and teams of workers ran to the scene only to vomit a wretch. Some, of course, sickly, had to take pictures with their phones. Real Facebook material here. Somehow, Jack had been caught in the intake of the massive lathe. What was left of him in no way resembled a human being, just bloody shreds of clothes and unrecognizable flesh. The machine had been up to full speed when the atrocity occurred, so blood was splattered across the entire work area, one man slipping on it as he approached the Gru. Even though the finisher had a safety shutoff, it mysteriously did not function, taking several revolutions and Jack's body with it to stop. The huge horizontal shaft still vibrated with power from the restrained motor. It was still on and ready to shave some more. It had tried to make Jack's body flattened and uniformly to one inch thickness with the tolerance of one thousandth of an inch finish, just like a piece of metal. Tanner and Corey spent the rest of the shift assisting the cleanup, as much as their stomachs would let them, as they knew the Haitian best. He and several others were interviewed by police and emergency responders. Corey had heard later that they had a sealed basket for a coffin. There was so little left of him. As Corey thought it best to collect Jack's few belongings from the locker they shared to return to the company, or whatever family he may have had, he spied the fortune shifter still on the workbench by some hand tools along with some of Jack's unfinished lunch. Corey knew that thing, with whatever black magic that perverted the longings of people like Tanner, had to go. Corey carefully grabbed the bowl, intending to take it to the trash compactor at the rear end of the factory and be done with it. Suddenly, he saw what had happened to Jack and shivered. The fortune shifter apparently answered to no one on this earth, including its twisted master. Now he saw why Observer, or whatever his real name is, was so fervent in keeping Jacques away in check, perhaps for eternity. 
But what was the incriminating evidence of the innate evil that could be done with the fortune shifter and its ability to patiently seduce and destroy lay at the bottom of the inner bowl chamber? Corey saw that part of Jack's taco had crumbled and fallen inside the bowl, now greasy with taco shell flakes and salsa. Beneath it, a piece of hamburger. Jack's hamburger. About a month later, Corey was packing up from an extra Saturday evening shift, wanting to get home. An attractive and available Abby Roseman from the assembly line had asked him to go to church with her tomorrow, and by golly, if he didn't take her up on it. As he slowly cruised out of the parking lot, he saw a despondent Tanner sitting on the curb by the shipping dock, head in hand, as the plant closed in the artificial factory light under a clear night sky. He pulled up and shut off his Sportster motorcycle for a moment. Hey man, what's wrong? It's about Jack, look. I'm not sorry to lose him because it wasn't really Jacques Away we were dealing with, you see. We really didn't know who he was. All that stuff he promised you is just provided to ultimately bring you down and maybe the rest of us along with you. Sad ass ending for him, but he got what he deserved. Somewhat oblivious, Tanner lamented, yeah, but now Sherry broke up with me. She and her friends all think I'm a creep now. Mayor Schmidt had some guys dig up a DUI that I got a few years ago and ran it in a campaign ad. Now I'll never get to be mayor. I've withdrawn from the race, man. And, oh yeah, the Camaro in my new garage won't start. Truck won't either. It's been sitting here all week. I guess it's back to being normal for me, so... What did you do with the fortune shifter? Corey recounted, I threw it in the trash compactor, swore I heard it scream when the piston smashed everything down. You got to see what it could do, but you could never see what it would cost you next. Sayonara to that freaking thing. No telling how many people's lives it could have screwed up. Yeah, I guess you're right. Hey man, can you give me a ride home? That's a long walk to my house after dark and who knows what's waiting out there in Yellowwood now? Not Jimmy Lee Harkin or Jacques Oye, that's for sure, Corey thought. Tanner clumsily stumbled down the curb as he rose to get on the bike's small seat. Corey just shook his head and said, By the way, it's good to have the old you back. I hope you enjoyed tonight's tale, The Fortune Shifter, by Eric Fisher. Eric Fisher is a landscape site designer and engineering drafter during the day and is a 70s style rock guitarist who writes music and fiction for recreation and moral purpose. He has composed or is in the process of completing several short stories and novellas in the supernatural fiction and alternate history realm. Literary influences are Harry Turtledove, Stephen R. Donaldson, Frank Peretti, Frank Herbert, Philip Dick, and Stephen King. Fisher resides in his fictional communities of Yellowwood, Indiana, or Wacot, Kentucky, whenever possible. You don't want to know everything that goes on there. If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S.net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page 
or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens. So if you haven't subscribed yet, I'd really appreciate it. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland. Chilling tales for dark nights.